Welcome to an I'll call to order the February 18th, 2020 meeting of Stillwater Planning Commission. Let me briefly go over explain the format of tonight's meeting. It will be the processing the call for items on the agenda. The commission will hear from the staff report first, and then open the public hearing and hear for those in favor or in opposition or neutral. You will have a five minute limit on your comments unless at the beginning of your presentation you ask for more and the entire commission approves that. When you come to the podium, please could state your name and address for the record. After all of your parties have spoken, the public will be closed. We'll hear closing remarks and I'll turn from the staff. First item, item 2A, is simply green quotes. Specific use permit SUP 19-33 requesting view and approval of specific use permit to establish a medical, medical marijuana growth facility, a property address that's 2000 meets HR Avenue in the Light Industrial District. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission, Ryan Harkins, Community Development. This is a, a growth facility that um, originally came on the agenda on January 7th and was referred to this date and time um, to allow for additional discussion regarding development in areas close to this in proximity. Hatched area along RJ is the proposed site. Um, RJ is currently a private street. You can see Jardot as well as um, Brook and other streets. The red line on this graphic is the corporate boundary. This aerial provides a view of the proposed building. This is looking west across Jarvo. And this is the proposed site plan. We're looking at utilizing a bay within a building within the current development. There are two buildings on the site right now. It is currently zoned light industrial, which allows for grow facilities for some SUP. With that, staff is going to yield the podium to the applicant or their agent for additional comments and presentation. Hello, my name is uh, Ralph Estrada. Uh, my name is Roberto Estrada from Tulsa, Oklahoma, with uh, Simply Green Crops. <clears throat> Do you want to say anything? Or... So my question is, this is a growth facility. You're going to be growing these plants indoors. Is that a correct statement? That's correct. So you're going to have a system indoors and have lights, and you will not be having any growth or any plants outside except to transport them. That's correct. Everything will be indoors, nothing outdoors at that location. Okay. Any other questions for that? Um, can you generally tell us about the security of your facility? Uh, will there be cameras? Will it be locked by a bit when there's no staff around? Can you tell us how that's going to work? Yes, currently we have a uh, camera system around all the units there, um, alarm system as well. Um, if we need to add more security with time, then we might need to, but as of now, we have the, just those two items, uh, security, security cameras and alarm system. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you. Let me officially open up the public hearing. Is anybody here? to speak in favor of this particular item. You've already spoken in favor, so you don't need to speak. <laughs> and, uh, is there anybody else that would like to speak in favor of this particular item? Seeing none, is there anybody here that would like to speak in opposition or neutral for this particular item? Anybody that would like to speak in opposition or neutral to this particular item? <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Come up here and give your name and address. And Good 
Kathy Houston, 1107 North Skyline Street. Um, I have a concern. I support medical marijuana. My best friend in Illinois lived two more years with stomach cancer because of pot pills that enabled her to eat. But we are just over the 1,000 foot legal limit from the junior high here. And anybody who watches the Oklahoma City News knows the, the problems that happen around dispensaries with people being followed home even. So cameras don't help that. Maybe catching the people, yes, but I don't know. Uh, and, and then robbed. I mean, why does this have to be? I want this to be somewhere. Well, why does it have to be so close to our junior high and our grade school? That's all. I want it to be taken into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Officially close the public hearing. Staff, you want to come up? So staff has developed in the staff report the following findings. Um, number one, state statutes allow for medical marijuana facilities. This is a grow facility. Um, grow facilities under state statutes do not have the thousand foot separation requirement that dispensaries do. Um, and because it, their land development code, grow, indoor grow operations have to be in a light or general industrial zoning. It's part of the reason for locations like this being um, allowed with a specific use permit. They do have a current license to operate a grow facility. They also have sufficient parking for the intended use. Having said that, the alternatives that you have available to you at this time are to one, accept the findings as presented and recommend approval to City Council. You can find the request is not appropriate and recommend denial. Or if you feel there's additional information or discussion that should happen with this item, you can have the option to table it to a particular date, sir. That staff will answer any questions you might have. Any question? Commission discussion? Anyone want to make a motion or? I move that we accept findings and recommend City Council approve the proposed SUP as presented. I second. Motion passes five to zero. Item 2B, RSR Oklahoma City North LLC Crafts and Tunnel self service Plenary Plant requesting review and approval of the Plenary Plant to create 182 residential lots and four outlots properly currently addressed as 1998 West 32nd Avenue and is currently zoned residential single family and agriculture. Good evening. Um, this is a preliminary plat that originally came to you on December 17th. It was delayed through the holidays to address one, various issues uh, between this and other potential developments nearby. Two, to address staff comments. And three, just because of the holidays and, and schedules of everyone involved. So it is now before you for full consideration. You have opened the public hearing on other occasions to address take comments. This is a preliminary plat at 32nd and Western. The area proposed for the development is in this location here. It actually stretches over toward the creek that you see. The bulk of developable lots being proposed, however, are in the hatch pattern basically from 32nd to the half mile marker. You can see here the overall area being proposed for development. This is looking north along western from the south. This is the proposed plat. They proposed 182 single family lots and four out lots. This is the creek here. It is in floodway. They have proposed making the floodway area one out lot, one common area. The detention pond here is another. You can see the lots having access to Western and 32nd. That's hence, hence two um, access points. They're proposing a third access point to the north to an additional proposed development that has been submitted to the city and is going through the internal review process right now. We'll be coming 
to you later. With that, staff is going to step aside and yield the podium. I have one question, sir, before that. Yes. <clears throat> the information you provided to all the commissioners, you have eight items that the development staff is recommending additional approval on based upon those eight items. Are those eight items still valid that you're still recommending conditional approval? They are. They are, um, they are changes that um, staff in the last review see that need to be made. Um, some of them are minor, minor changes or additional. So 15 for the 20 foot easement, relabeling of easements. Um, the, the biggest one, the developer and their agent, their engineer can address tonight dealing with sanitary sewer connections. They've given us um, confirmation that they have worked at that out with the property owner to the north and the proposed development to the north. They can explain that further, but they are basically going to take their sanitary sewer and run it to the north to a lift station that will connect to development to the north and then out to Crowley and Wilson. Most of these are, are things that can be done easily on their part. We feel from staff, but we feel it's important that they be addressed. Thank you. Any other questions staff can answer? The representative from the engineer and or developer. Good evening, Brad Reed, Craft and Toll, 300 Point Parkway Boulevard, Yukon, Oklahoma, here on behalf of the applicant. Um, if you have any particular questions, I'd be happy to answer those. I can, I can talk on the, the sanitary sewer if you want. That was brought up. I, I personally do not need for your talking about center sewer only to know that you it'll work. Yeah, so there, the, the, the issue is there's a current, you know, preliminary plat with a, so we had to get with their layout, but we're in agreement with SMC, who's their engineer. Uh, they've turned in their plan, um, and we're in agreement to work with them to get the sewer. Work. So the eight items that the community development staff has recommended that we approve this condition on these items. Do you have any comment or objections to any of those eight items? No, we do not. We are, we're, we're in agreement. Okay. Any questions of any of the commissioners? Or? Thank you very much. Let me officially open the public hearing. Is there anybody else that would like to speak in favor of this particular item? <coughs> Seeing no one, is there anyone that would like to speak against this item? Are neutral towards this item. Not seeing one, I will close the public hearing. Staff, you will come up and make your recommendation. So, in the staff report, as well as on the screen, you can see the following findings the preliminary plat meets the subdivision and zone requirements, with those eight exceptions listed in the staff report. Code requires subdivisions um, over 30 lots are required to provide two access points. They're proposing two exterior access points and then one to connect to proposed development to the north. Right now, the proposed development would have, um, well, it's, it's a zone zero family. It's a recommendation in the comp plan for high density and low density both. Um, current land use is land residential and agricultural. This development is in alignment with the density requirements of the RSS zoning district, however. With that said, you can approve the preliminary plat and accept these findings as presented. You can find the request is not appropriate and recommend denial. You can find that it can be approved with conditions, stipulate those conditions, and then the item will be brought back to you for reconsideration per city code. Or you can table the item to a certain date if you feel additional information is needed. Any other questions of that? Commission discussion or motion? Move that we accept the findings and prove the preliminary plan is presented with the recommended revisions as listed by the community development staff. Second. 
the eight, eight items that are in our packet. Yes, sir. Is there a second to that? Second. Let's vote. Motion passes five to zero. Item 2C, the Bosch Cannabis Company, specific use permit, we request you review and approve establish a grow and processing facility at 1198 East Airport Road in the Industrial General District. Okay, so this is the second of the SUPs on tonight's agenda. It's a grow facility and processing facility proposed on East Airport Road. The area and the hatch pattern that you see on the screen is the location of the proposed development. It is near Marine and Airport, so as you can see, to the east of Perkins. This is an aerial view of the, the land the lot in question. You can see the building that exists, that exists now that's being proposed for the grow and processing facility. You can see a number of areas for parking. As well as existing security fence on perimeter fence. This is the layout that they're looking at on their site plan. Uh, again, utilizing the existing buildings, they have adequate parking not only next to the building but farther out in the lot. So they would have plenty of room on site to any building expansion that need be, as well as handle parking and loading and unloading requirements. This is a view of the facility from the street. That staff, unless you have any questions for staff, we will yield the floor for the agents, for the applicant, for the applicant himself to answer any questions. Any questions for staff? Thank you. Good evening, Commissioner Stephen Gillis with Gillis and Associates, 113 East 8. Here on behalf of the applicant, um, Ryan covered it to address some of the questions from the previous one, the security um, operations. All operations will be in the building. There will be no outside growing or processing. And then there's those perimeter fences and the standard security system that they'll have and add to if necessary. So if there's any questions, other questions? My fellow commissioner pointed out that I mispronounced the name of your facility and I apologize for that. It's okay, it's not my facility. <laughs> <laughs> You're representing? Yes, I am. Sorry. Any questions? Any other questions for that? All right, thank you. Thank you. I'll open up the public hearing. Is there anybody else to speak in favor of this particular item? Seeing none, is there anybody here that would like to speak in opposition or neutral for this particular item? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Staff, you'll make your alternatives. Certainly. We have to. So currently, as with the previous SUP tonight, state law allows for medical marijuana facilities, provided they have a license, which they do. Land development code in this zoning district allows indoor growth facilities, provided they have an SUP. And just to help demonstrate the difference. Under the land development code, outdoor growth facilities are only allowed in ag zoning districts. Indoor growth facilities are only allowed in our industrial zoning districts. We also see, as you can tell on the graphics, there's adequate parking on site as well as plenty of room to handle any expansion. With that said, the alternatives available to you are to accept the findings and recommend approval as presented. You can find the request is not appropriate and recommend denial or you can table the item to a particular date later if you feel additional information or discussion is needed. Any questions of staff that we can answer? Any questions of staff? Seeing none, do we have discussion or motion? I move that we accept the findings and recommend that the City Council approve the proposed specific use permit as presented. Second. Hello? Motion passes five to zero. Item 2D, CHC management, preliminary plat, requesting review approval to 
create a new resident subdivision named Skyline East Section 2, consisting of 132 residential lots and two out lots on property addressed at 1798 North Payne. Staff? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. So, at this time, this item again came to you on January 7th, and then was deferred to February 4th, and then to this meeting allow for additional discussion. The hashed area is the proposed development. The area inside the yellow is generally the, the area in question or the subject property. You can see Sunrise to the south, Jardot, as well as Skyline and Crailer. Crailer being the area on the north side of the junior high campus. Skyline Elementary is to the east, just off of this area. This is the proposed plat, as it's been presented and reviewed by staff. They propose, at the present time, access along Payne being extended in, more being extended in from its current stub, as well as Crailer being extended in on the north end of the proposed development, as well as an internal circulation system of streets and sidewalks. They also propose two outlots, one on the northeast and one on the southeast corner to handle drainage. Part of the issues up to this point have dealt with traffic, as far as traffic volume, traffic flow, generation of traffic, uh, additional traffic in this area due to the presence of traffic issues already with the school site to the west, as well as the density. The applicant has provided a traffic in impact analysis, even though it would typically only be required at the final class stage. That has recommended no new additional improvements and showed that the access points were adequate. There was additional discussion and desire for communication regarding between the neighborhood, the schools, and city staff. I can tell you we've had that meeting. We discussed issues relating to concerns about the school site itself and drop-off and pick-up times. What the school is looking at doing is adding a access drive sometime in the next two to five years along the west side of the junior high building between that and the athletic field. There was discussion about street width um, being adequate along Sunrise, for example, as well as the number of access points. Some of the issues that, and potential solutions that were discussed were closing more and making that a pedestrian and access easement, so that would limit automobile traffic there. The other, another option that was proposed was closing pain and not having that access for vehicles, but only being a drainage utility and access easement as well. That would mean traffic would have a crater, um, and if pain was enclosed, that pain would be the second. The neighborhood and their representatives still feel Jardot, as part of their previous planning commission meetings and public hearings, still feel Jardot is an access that is needed. Um, their response and follow-up letter to staff from that meeting is in your packet um, with their reasons why. One of the things staff has additionally heard of, out of this these discussions is that it is incompatible based on density. Staff's response is this proposed development meets the density as allowed in the RSS zoning district. It's also we feel compatible with the comprehensive plan based on the following. One, the future land use element, specifically the future land use and map. Two, goal 2A, 2B, 6A, 6D, and 8J, dealing with not only housing, but also traffic and compatibility, as well as connectivity. With that said, staff will stand for any questions before we go to the applicant and their agent for presentation. You made a statement that the traffic study shows that the connections to the residential streets are adequate. 
What in the traffic study leads you to that conclusion? That was their conclusion and their, their recommendation. Mm -hmm. They felt no additional connections besides the three proposed were needed. They actually were in the, the meeting via conference call with staff, school district, and residents. They walked through why they felt their recommendations were justifiable. We also talked in that about why that has been the school district, as far as that site, has had problems, and then what the neighbors have experienced as far as pedestrians and traffic issues. And the neighbors were very gracious in sharing from their perspective on the ground what they see. Part of that discussion that came out was there hasn't been a lot of discussion with neighbors, residents in those subdivisions, and staff in the past about those traffic concerns, the traffic volumes, or the street conditions. So that was one of the ongoing things that hopefully out of this process we can begin working together. <coughs> but that is the recommendation of the traffic study and the traffic engineer. Thank you. There are other recommendations I would say to dealt more with internal on the school site itself. Other questions, staff can answer. Any other questions of staff at this time? Thank you. Applicant? Good evening again, Stephen Ghost, Ghost and Associates, 113 East 8. Here on behalf of the applicant, um, again requesting approval of the preliminary plat for a 27 acre, 132 lot single family subdivision, uh, tabled from the previous two meetings uh, for various reasons. Tonight to address the traffic, uh, Esther Shaw Smith with Lee Engineering is here who prepared the traffic study, so I'll let her address those items. Um, there was a a couple of items I just wanted to address. Ryan touched on them a little bit, but the density specifically. Um, last time there was some some confusion uh, on the density. The density, as defined in our code, is the amount or quantity of something per unit of measure, the number of units in a given land area or building area, gross density, which is what applies in this with regard to the comprehensive plan, and the zoning is gross density is units per acre density measurement that includes in the calculation all land occupied by use, right-of-way or easement, recreational activity, civic activity, building, parking, landscaping, and any other improvement necessary for the development. So in the context of this request, you know, we're at 4.6, 4.8 units an acre. The comp plan calls for 20 units an acre or less. The zoning calls for eight units uh, or less. Um, the other items I have, uh, we can address later, depending on the public hearing. Um, but we'll we'll get Esther up here to talk about the traffic, how they did what they did, and, and what their findings mean from that. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman and Commissioners. Esther Shaw Smith. And J Agent Lee Engineering, 525 Central Park Drive, Oklahoma City. I just wanted to go through an overview of the traffic study. I know you've seen it in your packets. Um, we did confirm the data collection sites with the city via conference call with them on December 18th, so they're fully aware of the areas that we can perform our data collection. We performed peak hour, AM, and PM uh, turning movement counts and 24 hour counts on your. Uh, arterial major and minor arterials. Um, the major intersections were also um, performed data collection at those major intersections and arterial roadways because those are critical to your traffic flow and mobility within the community. Um, they provide fewer access points and higher speeds and volumes. So those are your critical areas that you need to keep traffic flowing. Uh, local streets are not included in data collection simply because uh, these are inherently low speeds and low volumes, and this is where you have your most access. You have your driveways, your trash cans, your sidewalks, everything like that is inside of those local roadway streets, and those are, that's just the industry standard of basic access management versus mobility uh, in your communities. Um, based on the preliminary plat, 
the development is supposed to include 132 residential lots. You guys already know that. Um, based on those chirp generation rates from the Institute of Tra Transportation Engineers, the ITE, which has a chirp generation handbook that all traffic engineers follow, uh, that equates to 99 total trips in the AM. That would be um, 25 into the development, 74 out of the development of AM peak hour. Uh, for the PM peak hour, there's going to be 133 total trips generated. That's 84 into the development and 49 out. Um, the AM and PM peak hours are typically from 7.15 to 8.15 in the morning for a development like this. And also in the evening be from 4 to 5 p.m. Uh, that AM peak hour, as you probably know, does coincide with Skyline Elementary by about 15 minutes. They have a start time of 8 o'clock. Uh, the PM uh, does not coincide with either the Stillwater Junior High or Skyline Elementary. Um, since they release the elementary at 2.50 and then the junior high ends at 3.50. So we don't have overlapping um, PM peak hours. We have about 15 minutes in the AM. Um, the estimated trips, so we take those trips and we distribute them on the roadway network and we distribute them based on how existing traffic is coming and leaving the current development now. So that leaves around 40% that's going to the north and to the west or 55% to the north and the west, 40% going south and to the west, and then 5% going east or using Jardel. Uh, it's really most of the city is kind of west of this development. Um, operational analysis at the study area intersections and roadway uh, was performed. And it was found that traffic generated by Skyline is not significant enough to have a large impact on your arterial or major collector streets and they all operate at levels of service of C or better still. And the access points that were proposed by the developer were adequate. I, I should mention though that the extension of Grandview was used in this analysis as it will be installed prior to build out of this development. And that was indicated so you by- you assumed in your traffic study that a street that has not been built yet is connected? Correct, sir. So what, what and that was at the rationale or what evidence do you have that that street will be connected and at what time? I was directed by city staff during our meetings that that would be something that would be happening and the applicants said they would start within the next few months on that extension. Because we look at future roadway conditions when we look at the future condition analysis and so we have to say if there's or if there are planned developments or planned roadway improvements we need to incorporate that into this study. Uh, we did observe operations at Skyline Elementary and at the Stillwater Junior High to observe the queuing and stacking. Uh, it did last for around 10 to 15 minutes. Um, we did notice that pedestrians and students have infrastructure on their school grounds with sidewalks, signage, school zone flashers. There's a four-way stop sign at, at Skyline and Sunrise. They have high visibility crosswalks. And we did observe students using proper paths to, to walk, so no major safety issues were observed um, with those students crossing or with them mobilizing through the neighborhood. Most of those students traveled north or to the west after they left the school site. And I know that you do have a few items from, from the neighborhood that I just you know, wanted to, to point out. And they did have a capacity issue on Sunrise and where they had mentioned that that roadway just can't handle any more cars. Um, according to its roadway classification, um, and I would call it a local road really, but um, it's 5,000 vehicles per day is the capacity of that roadway. Right now it has less than 1,500 vehicles a day. Um, I know that you had a, a neighbor, uh, Mr. Goat, he did go and count Sunrise and Jardot. We also counted that location, and his counts are very consistent with our counts. Uh, he had 292 total vehicles entering and exiting um, sunrise during two hours in the a.m. and we actually had 145 in one hour so it was really i mean they correlate to the same number of cars that, that, the, that the neighborhood state has seen versus what's in the report and then um, i think i've addressed kind of that foot traffic issue from this on um, with we did acknowledge the pedestrians, we did count the pedestrians at the study area intersections. 
around the school. Um, I'm happy to answer any additional questions uh, that you may have at this time or after the public hearing. Any other questions at this time? Mr. Gilbs, can you come back up here? I've got a couple of questions from you. The Grandview Connection. Yes, sir. It, it's it's included in the study. Yes. G, at the last meeting, I asked a question, which hopefully you have some sort of response to, in terms of when will that be implemented and what can we count on that? What, what do so we have to count on that? Those plans have been reviewed and approved by city staff as part of work happening in Eastridge second edition with to, to create and build out the lots on the north side of Swim and on the west side of Grandview. Part of why Grandview hasn't got built prior to this is various property owners on the west and the east could never get on the same page to get the right of way and who's building the road lined up. Our client on that, who's also partner in this, has acquired the right of way from the property owner to the east. That deed has been sent to the city. Last I heard, it was in the city attorney's office, signed and notarized by the property owner on the east side of Grandview. So it just needs to be accepted by city council as the right of way. The plans are, like I said, have been reviewed and approved by city staff. So that road is really close to getting ready to be built. It's not conceptual. It's approved plans and, and right away. So, so let me follow the series of questions and then you can respond the way you want to respond is, it, is it okay that we approve this development contingent upon Grandview being in place before the final plot comes back to this commission? Uh, we're, we're fine with that condition. I mean, our, the, our intent is for that road to be built prior to a house being occupied in Skyline East. Okay. That answers my question. Okay. Anything else? Any other questions? Yes. Um, what did you say was financially contributing to buying the easement so that brand new could be a through street? It was dedicated. There was no money exchanged for the dedication of that east half of the right of way. Okay. All, right. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will officially open up the public hearing. We have eight people signed up to speak. I will have these eight people speak and then open it up to other people for or against this. And I want to apologize up front that I'm an engineer and not good in the English language or pronouncing things, so I definitely will mess up your names. Simon Ringsmith. Handouts for each of you. The last page has been rotated 180 degrees, so it's kind of upside down the way you're looking at it. <clears throat> I also need to get my PowerPoint pulled up here. Thank you, city staff, for getting this loaded. I appreciate it. And I would like to request additional time. I promise to use this time wisely and efficiently and not waste anyone's time here tonight. So the time, based upon your email, is eight minutes. That's, that's, that's what I asked. Minutes. Yes. And without objection from other commissioners, we will provide extra time to speak. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good evening, members of the Planning Commission. The key points I'm going to focus on tonight are density, traffic, and safety. And I'd like to start with this quote from the Stillwater Comprehensive Plan. It states that development should be designed to promote street patterns that provide maximum safety and mobility for all modes of transportation while preserving neighborhood integrity. Skyline East, as currently platted, meets city code, but it doesn't fulfill the mandate set forth by the comprehensive plan. As currently platted, Skyline East is not the right development for this location, and I'd like to demonstrate why tonight. Skyline East will be right here when it's finished on, and include 132 houses. As the developers pointed out, this density is similar to Eastridge, which is a quarter mile to the rest. 
uh, to the uh, to the west. But what about the neighborhood where Skyline East is being built? You would have to expand your search all the way out here to find 132 houses. I know I've counted them. Skyline East is 27 acres, about 4.8 houses per acre. But the neighborhood it sits in is far different. To find 132 houses, you would need an area that comprises 106 acres, or a gross density of 1.24 houses per acre. That means that Skyline East is almost four times as dense as the surrounding neighborhood. If housing developments are to, to be done to preserve neighborhood integrity, this is not the way to do it. But from the beginning, my chief concerns have been traffic and safety, and this is where we run into some key issues. On this map, the red markers indicate locations where the traffic study was conducted. This can be found on pages 6, 7, and 8 of the traffic study. I've also highlighted Skyline Elementary and the Senior High. The results of the traffic study indicate that Skyline East would not have a major impact on artery roads. This is on page 18 27. But the issue at hand is not artery roads. Dr. Moore stated in the January 7th meeting that Skyline Elementary is a neighborhood school, which means more children walk to school more of the traffic comes to these schools from inside the area bounded by Lakeview, Jardo, and McElroy. Given the intersections where the traffic study was conducted, it means that there was simply no data collected on parents taking children to and from school within the neighborhood. Further, the traffic study did not gather data on the impact of Skyline East on neighborhood streets, nor were pedestrian counts. I'm talking actual data used to look at the number of school children who cross these streets. The three most important streets here are Sunrise, Skyline, and Crayler, since Skyline East residents will have to use those to get to Artery Roads. The developers offered to close off more, which is a start, but it's frankly not enough. That would leave Sunrise and Crayler. So let's take a look at Sunrise and Crayler. First, Sunrise. It's 20 feet, one inch wide. We know because we measured. It's 20% narrower than all the surrounding neighborhood streets, many of which are 25 feet wide. This means that east-west traffic is dangerously close to each other. And you can go to Sunrise today and see the tire tracks in the grass where vehicles continually drive off the road. On this slide, you can see a situation that's fairly typical of school pickup and drop-off times. There's not enough room for this school bus and this truck to pass each other safely. You'll notice that the truck is driving off the road. And nearly all the residents on the north side of the street have had to replace their mailboxes. Several of them here tonight, and they'll attest to that, because their mailbox mailboxes get hit. Skyline East traffic would make this situation a whole lot worse, not just for people driving on these streets, but for residents of Skyline East trying to get in and out. Here's what it looks like when a bus drives down the road. Notice while maintaining a safe distance from mailboxes and trash cans, the bus takes up over half of the road. There's no room for another car to pass without driving off the side. Next, I'd like to address Crayler. Traffic from Skyline East would exit here and go west to Benjamin, or Grandview when it's finished. And we were told by the developer, this is actually the primary access point for Skyline East. However, this is Crayler during hours of peak operation. You can see it's clogged with all kinds of traffic, including vehicles just parked on the road. You can also see students walking across Skyline. The developers offered solutions, such as a crosswalk or signs, but that's like using a Band-Aid to fix a broken arm. These students are going to cross where they see an opening. And Superintendent Moore stated on January 7th, they expect Skyline East would add 30 to 35 additional students. And all of them are going to cross just like this. They're not going to go down and wait for a crosswalk. These are the conditions that school children cross in and will cross in, even worse when Skyline East is built. Here you can see literally uh, vehicles literally parked side by side on Crayler. Remember, this you're looking at the main access point to Skyline East right here. It's right where that yellow bus is parked, blocking all lanes of traffic with more cars next to it. Finally, this is Skyline Street. We're looking north here. This is Skyline coming southbound during pickup and drop off. That four way stop sign is right next to me when I took this picture. And these cars are backed up for almost a quarter of a mile. That makes Skyline East access extremely problematic. And these situations were not measured by the traffic study. The traffic impact study found that artery roads and the five main intersections from the neighborhood were, were equipped to handle traffic from Skyline East, but the traffic study did not measure pedestrian traffic going in and out of schools, nor did it look at the width of Sunrise Street, nor did it investigate drop-off at the junior high and elementary school. 
What they did do is offer this suggestion. The school should consider drop-off and pick-up procedures that maximize vehicle storage on site to limit spillback on adjacent roadways. This is page 26 of the traffic study. School administrators have been working hard to do exactly this for years, but it's just not this simple. The junior high is hoping to address, this, address busing issues with a bond measure that's going to be voted on in 2023, but there's, that's years down the road, and there's no guarantee the voters will approve it. But I want to address something. You could say that these photos are edge case scenarios. You could say that the pictures I'm showing here are only one part of the picture, since these streets are relatively quiet most of the day outside peak hours. But ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that most streets in any neighborhood are relatively quiet most times of the day. When you build any system, whether it's planning a street, wiring a room, or installing a sewer line, you build it to handle load during times of peak operation, especially city streets. Stillwater spent years rebuilding intersections like 6th and Perkins, not to handle traffic at 10 a.m. or 9 p.m., but during peak operational hours. We've rebuilt intersections and entire streets here in town just to handle football game traffic, and that's only six or seven days a year. All we're asking from Skyline East is one section of road, 100 yards long, to get traffic away from school zones like this and onto Jardo. Here's how Skyline East is currently planted with no Jardo access, and here's what it would look like with Jardo access. Cut off access to Sunrise and more, build that 100 yard stretch of road, and you now have a housing development that guides traffic right to an artery away from school zones. I still contend that the density is much too high and not the right fit for the neighborhood, but if that can't be changed, then at least give those people access to Jardot without going through school zones. Before I close, I want to address two other quick points. First, there have been concerns raised about adding Jardo access because it would create another point of conflict by adding an access point on an artery, and that could lead to more intersections or more accidents. This concern makes sense in normal situations, but we're not talking about, we're talking here about adding access points specifically to guide traffic away from a school zone, which is not only reasonable but prudent. Currently, there are 10 intersections on Jardo between 6 and McElroy, it's a one mile stretch of road. One of them, Duke Avenue, was added just a few years ago to address traffic concerns. Between McElroy and Lakeview, there's only three. Adding a fourth for Skyline East puts it far below the normal amount for artery roads in Stillwater and would make access to Skyline East easier and safer. Additionally, the Grandview extension that we've been talking about tonight would create an access point on an artery road. If it can work there, it can work for Skyline East. Finally, the last point I want to address is what our neighborhoods can look like in the coming years after each bridge two is developed. Here's how things look now with eastbound traffic going to with eastbound traffic go, going on trailer through a neighborhood of Benjamin and then north to Lakeview. During peak hours, Benjamin is backed up just like the skyline slide you saw earlier. This spot of land here, the red spot, is zoned for planned urban development. It's going to get developed. Many, uh, uh, it's going to get houses made by the same developers in Skyline East. And here's what it's going to look like after the new East Ridge 2 development is in place. Once Grandview is extended, we've heard of Grandview as the solution to a lot of problems. Once Grandview is extended and homes are built on that parcel of land, all the traffic from Skyline East using trailer to get to Lakeview is going to have to go through that new neighborhood to get to Lakeview. It's literally going to take the problematic situation on Benjamin that we already have and not solve it, but move it a quarter mile to the east. The same problem that we currently have is going to still be there because there's going to be a new neighborhood developed that will have houses in it with traffic that we'll need to contend with. Yes, the Grandview extension will help in the short term. And the developers have stated they're not going to allow parking on Grandview, which will also help. But in the long term, we'll be right back to where we started. And then it's going to be impossible to add an extension from Skyline East to Jardo, even if the city did want to. The bottom line here is that many of these issues could be solved if Skyline East removed access to Moore and Sunrise and put in a road to Jardo. It's a 100-yard stretch of pavement that would solve a host of problems now, prevent all sorts of issues in the future, and make the neighborhood safer for school children. Either that, or I hope the developer seriously considers reducing the housing density of Skyline East to maintain the integrity of the neighborhood. Commissioners, thank you so much for your time, and thank you to all parties involved for your work on this. Thank you very much. Bob? Please, please, no clapping. Bob Roman? Good 
evening. Thank you. My name is Bob Grawlin. Um, I'm speaking tonight uh, first to represent the Stillwater Board of Education, uh, Dr. Morrison. Can you give me your address? 2224 Sunset Drive. Thank you. So, sorry. Um, Dr. Moore says his regrets. He's uh, training for uh, at a conference in Atlanta and uh, asked me to uh, uh, come do the honors for him. And uh, since I have one month left in my five-year school board term, I thought I could do him at least one favor. Right, so here I am. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity. I've been fascinated by this whole topic ever since I started attending the first, first meetings and the first discussions. Um, and tonight, I am going to try as best I can to represent the Stillwater Board of Education and the Stillwater Public School System in my role as president. But I also have been interested in the discussions for other reasons, too, as I'll try to explain at the end of my comments. I have very few details to offer that Superintendent Moore hasn't already presented thanks to his familiarity with the schools and the expertise of teachers and administrators. He has spent many hours examining the facts and proposals, as well as engaging his staff, including the extremely able director of our transportation division, who is well known for his expertise. The schools, as always, will adjust to whatever the situation dictates, while hoping the best decisions are made for an efficient and safe school environment inside and outside the building. Buildings in this case. We think we have proven ourselves capable of that, not only in the location under discussion, but in the area for where the current middle school and Sanger Ridge Elementary are in close proximity, in much the same way that the junior high and skyline are. These are challenging topics that create a lot of confusion among the public about who's responsible for what. And it's rather obvious to point out, and while new school measures may alter and somewhat improve the situations, more can only be done with the assistance of city planners, such as you. Schools can't do everything is something repeated often in educational circles these days, and with good reason. And I was struck by the notion that somehow there's wishful thinking that the schools are going to provide a road that will ease the congestion. Well, I don't know how up you are on school bonds, but that is not a part of our responsibility. Uh, and uh, we will adjust as much as we can to the areas that we're responsible for, but otherwise, it's impossible for us to make commitments such as that. So as Dr. Moore has stated, we look at the realities of population to plan for the future. In this case, with the changing configurations, a possible result of a future bond, shifts in demographics, and potential growth of Stillwater, we are confident of our ability to adjust. Such is the way of educators. Your teachers and administrators will find a way I'm sure. We are not, however, unaware of the potential complications and even hazards of the current proposal. I have, each of the meetings I have attended eventually addresses seriously the potential bottlenecks in traffic flow and resulting risk for those who drive, bike, walk to either the junior high or skyline, and the need for further and efficient approaches and departures from the schools is well known. After driving the area myself, I asked others, including the principals and teachers, what they thought of the decision facing you tonight. The response was, and this is a, a kind of the overall summary of what I heard, okay, but the obvious channeling of more cars into the immediate areas, area with no change in egress can't help but create problems that concern me. I don't need to repeat what I'm calling the Jardo solution, along with other measures such as new traffic lights in strategic areas, improved sidewalks, perhaps one-way streets for certain times of the day, or even a reduction in density per number of dwellings in the area under discussion. 
all of which could make a big difference in how this project feels and is embraced. And I had not even uh, heard the phrase the Grand View Extension until until tonight. But, um, I'll have to I'll have to uh, run that over in my brain and see what I think of it. So much for what the schools see and hope for based on best evidence. And I'm going to switch roles just a minute because in addition to my board duties, I'm also a veteran of the campaign to create the Westwood Neighborhood Association, which, in our humble opinion, for many years has maintained policies to reduce conflicts that could have quickly doomed that neighborhood otherwise. I can tell you with complete candor that without the efforts of many individuals and the cooperation of city government, the beautiful new school on 6th Street would likely have been constructed somewhere else. And a top 100 national school would have been moved away from the rundown area it was fast becoming at one time more than a decade ago. The reason that it worked is the simplest of all democratic principles, that when growth and tradition come face to face, each side must give something in order to get something. I believe that's what's at stake here. And I hope you and the rest of city government can oversee a solution for development and prosperity, not bad things necessarily, are carried out with regard to the equally important issue, issues of tradition, comfort, and safety for all citizens, especially in our town of Stillwater that prizes its reputation for educational excellence and comfortable residential life. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Anthony Shore. My name is Anthony Shore. I live at 2001 East London Avenue. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I have heard the traffic study submitted in the support of this proposal and would like to make some remarks on that. Traffic study says a site's accessibility is affected by the geographical location development with respect to other activities. The most notable other activity in this area is, of course, the schools. I think we caught that today. Of the 133 pages of the report, a mere 320 words address the activity of the schools in this area. Of these 320 words, 43 of these words are voted to in schools that they should consider drop off of pickup procedures that maximize vehicle storage on site. Scott Elementary School does have drop off and pickup on site, and yet they still have queuing in the adjacent streets. Even if the junior high improves its vehicle queuing, the amount of pedestrian and bicycle traffic is unlikely to change. The purpose of school crossings is to protect children walking and bicycling to and from school. The traffic study does not mention the school crossing at McElroy Skyline, does not mention the school crossing at Skyline and Sunrise, and does not mention the school zone at Skyline and Sunrise. Indeed, one third of this development to protect additional traffic will pass through the school zone intersection at Skyline and Sunrise, and yet the study mentions nothing about that. Now, I heard today they said they observed this. They observed the area. That's not in the report. None of the information is in the report, if not there for analysis. So the traffic patterns generated by the proposed plat, as designed, will not improve the safety of the children using these school zones. Article 12 of the Planning and Zoning Subdivision Regulations of the City of Stillwater states, the City of Stillwater shall have full power to promote the public health, safety, and general welfare by regulating the use of property and by controlling and directing the development of the city. That's your job. That's what's been entrusted to you. I believe that the proposed development plan does not promote the public health and safety of the residents of the City of Stillwater, and I urge you to reject it. Leslie Meyer. Leslie Meyer. Hello, my name is Leslie Meyer. I live at 1102 North Payne Street. In the original comprehensive plan commissioned by the city of Stillwater, 
Low density residential was defined as all single family and two family residential uses that involve a gross density of four dwelling units or less per acre. In the C3 plan adopted in 2013 and currently in effect, the definition of low density residential was changed to conventional single family detached dwellings, two family units, and low density multifamily with a gross density up to 20 units per acre. Wow, that is quite a change over time. Keep in mind that many of the neighborhoods in our area were in existence for years or even decades before the first comprehensive plan was adopted in 2001. The current definition for low density might work for newly developed areas of town, but not for infill development in long existing neighborhoods. Current homeowners are unable to protect their investments the quality of life and property values can be eroded without recourse. In my opinion, this is not progress. The original comprehensive plan states, contains these statements. It is the intent of this plan to ensure development standards that conserve and enhance existing development. And a key component to this plan is enhancing and maintaining the viability of existing neighborhoods. I believe that infill development must be compatible with the surrounding area. Who better understands what is compatible than the existing residents in the area? Perhaps changing the definition of low density was a mistake without setting limits on how much the density can be increased relative to the adjacent neighborhoods. Also, there seems to be no guidelines in the C3 plan to protect our school zones from unmanageable increases in traffic. These issues are exactly what have brought us to this point. To go forward with this plan as proposed would be the second mistake. When my sisters and I were growing up, my parents used to tell us that two wrongs don't make a right. Maybe some of you all have heard that before. That is where we are coming from as existing residents of this area of town. Introduction of Skyline East into this neighborhood will change the quality of life for existing residents. The added traffic from 132 homes will have a negative effect on the school zone and neighborhood if it proceeds as currently planned. The developer is trying to solve a problem by providing workforce housing within walking distance of the schools. In this case, the solution to one problem will substantially aggravate a problem that already exists at current traffic levels. This is not just a neighborhood issue. Parents from all over Stillwater are already dealing with this. It will only increase over time as Stillwater grows. <coughs> Sunrise may not be at capacity now, but if it becomes that way in the future, it will be too late to introduce a pressure relief valve for the skyline east traffic in the form of a dedicated exit to Jardo. During the two to three years of construction, all equipment will be coming in and out through the school zone, even with Grand View completed. Direct access to Jardo solves this problem completely. It also solves the traffic problem at peak times. Residents in emergency vehicles would have access to Skyline East and would not be competing with or adding to the traffic in the school zone. This would leave Sunrise, Skyline, and Kramer open for school traffic when congestion is a problem. Extending Grandview is necessary for this same developer to build out the remainder of East Ridge. In addition, it promises to relieve school-related traffic in the East Ridge neighborhood. Concern for slowing the flow of traffic on Lakeview or a greater risk for accidents has not seemed to be an issue. Why is the additional intersection on Jardo such an issue? Without it, all traffic in and out of Skyline East will go directly through the school zone during peak traffic times for the schools. That is definitely a recipe for increased accidents. The risk of additional accidents on Jardo would be minimal as the traffic is already slowed down to 20 miles per hour in the school zone during peak times. We should apply the same logic to both situations. Grandview should have been extended to Lakeview at the time East Ridge was built. Residents have put up with years of frustration over a traffic problem that should have never been there in the first place. 
We are asking for a direct exit to Dardo and to change more and Payne Streets to pedestrian walkways in a good faith effort to protect the safety of pedestrians and drivers in the school zone and to help preserve the quality of life for existing residents in the area. Please consider the long-term impact of decisions made today and seek a solution for the greater good of the whole Stillwater community. Now is the time to make sure that we are not faced with a bigger traffic and safety problem in the future and left with no way to fix it. Thank you for letting me share my thoughts. Thank you. David Nome.
allows six inches between the buses to pass. And I'd like to use my multimedia presentation skills to demonstrate this is six inches. This is what's, what would be allowed between buses as they pass. It's certainly close enough for the bus drivers to give each other a high five as they go by, but it's not a safe distance uh, to keep between buses. Um, as a result, um, the street, um, if you look at the photos that I've provided, uh, the street situation has deteriorated around sunrise. Uh, Simon showed uh, pictures of vehicles actually going off of the road. Um, I'll, I'll call your attention to these very quickly and we'll run through these. Um, the first photo, photo A, it just demonstrates the general street width that's taken from the inside of my small Honda SUV. And B actually shows a pickup truck just driving down that street, uh, very narrow. Uh, and item C, uh, if you look closely, you'll see this is at the intersection of Skyline and Sunrise looking east. When the road was constructed or reconstructed, it was constructed much narrower than it was originally made. Um, you can actually see the taper of the road uh, from the corner into the existing roadbed. The lateral tapers in. And also the collection of water in the ruts that, that have been generated as a result of this narrow street. Um, had the street been made a, a wider width, it would be appropriate for the neighborhood, then um, these situations may not have occurred. Um, the uh, code, as I understand it, for a minimum street width in Stillwater is 20 feet for bar ditches. Um, photo D actually shows the bar ditch, which is more of a depression and also the ruts that run the entire of uh, sunrise. Um, and the last, uh, the photo E shows the, the, <coughs> shows the drainage across the street. And uh, photo F uh, shows that there's actually probably more water being carried in the ruts than there is in the barges. Um, finally, the last thing I'd like to say is um, you know, the potential issues with additional traffic on sunrise. The street's too narrow as it is. Difficult to handle traffic. I did a traffic count, my own personal traffic count. Uh, they mentioned uh, almost 300 cars. I need to point out that 270 cars were counted in 90 minutes, and that included 19 buses. So um, I think there's a, a significant traffic impact. And if I could uh, mention, you'll, you'll have one of your alternatives tonight is uh, to find that the preliminary plat is not an appropriate use of the property based upon the impacts to the surrounding vicinity. And do not recommend that the city council approve the preliminary plat. And I'd like you to consider that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Matthew Wyckoff. Okay, so what I've <coughs> prepared a little thing here, so I'm just going to give you a And I've made it a little bit easier. It has an outline on the front. And I'm going to skim through this as much as possible because I know the five minutes is really not going to be enough time. There's been a lot of talk about artery street intersections, and I understand that um, what we're looking at here is that the data shows that if you have an intersection into an artery street, you're going to have more accidents at that intersection. Uh, however, that doesn't seem to touch what would happen to an accident within the non artery street, the residential street. Yes, the, the uh, speed limit is lower, but you're, you're going to be putting a lot more poss possibility of having an accident with kids and pedestrians than you would on an arterial street. So I think that's one point that needs to be covered. Also, like with Duke and the Renaissance, um, it doesn't seem to have a problem having access points to an artery street when the developer wants it. I mean, the Renaissance is an apartment complex and it has two Accesses two access points to Jardo 
in less than a block. So Grand Union is another one goes, as long as the developer seems to want it, it seems to be okay. Um, we don't build streets for normal traffic. We build them to handle peak traffic. As can be exhibited by what was said earlier with the game day traffic. Not only was Perkins and Sixth uh, altered, Western and Sixth was altered, and the on ramps and off ramps to I-35 and 51 were altered for those that traffic seven days a year. So I think that's a big thing there. Uh, class C traffic. It was brought up that our, our area has class C traffic. And if you go back and rewatch the uh, the presentation on that day, I believe within five minutes, it was said that Class C is the worst possible uh, rating that it could have anyway. So yes, for 150,000 more cars in there, you're not going to have any worse rating, but it's still going to be an impact to that area. The 100-year flood zone, a five-foot ditch um, that we want that they want to put in uh, north of or south on the south end of the property. Uh, the, that 100 year plan is based on what happens, you know, supposedly within 100 years. Um, I think it was also brought up that we had three of those events last spring, a year ago. So it's very possible, especially with the wet winter that we've had, that that could happen again. Since the utilities run right next to that easement, to where that ditch is going, and a five foot ditch, if you don't have specialized equipment, mowing that is going to be very difficult. If you look at the corner of Giorgio and Lakeview, on the east southeast corner, you'll see what I'm talking about. Drive by, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. If you look at the ditch that is just north of McElroy on the east side of the road where the pasture is, they have chosen to use weed killer and pesticides to keep the, the down because they can't mow it. This would degrade the ditch. Then where would that water go? Right into the utilities that are in the ground on the south side of the proposed development. Um, school zones versus other areas. Yes, the local statutes, the local, local, say, two exits for this type of development. Um, I don't believe that that was really kept into consideration when going to the school zones. I mean, if you look at the previous presentation of that today for 32nd and Western, the two exits were both on two arterial streets, 32nd and Western. It wasn't to a school zone. Understandable. This is what we're talking about. Um, and we're in discussion about the developer saying how well he builds and how well he is. He puts his stamp on everything. Um, as a developer, is not liable for anything that happens on my property. So no matter what he does in his, he's only liable for a limited amount of time for the homeowner that he sells to. But nothing to any of the surrounding area, nothing to the school zone, nothing. So I don't really see his, his how nice a house he builds. If he's worsening the neighborhood, it's regardless of how nice as the houses are, it's still going to impact the rest of us. Uh, if he really cared about putting a stamp on it, the addition name would not be Skyline East, it would be Jimbo's addition. But that's just what I have to say. The, other thing that I have to say is there's been stalling tactics here uh, by the developer and his um, associates, such as not giving you the um, traffic assessment till the day of. I mean, that's just one thing. The 300 foot radius, we all know that a school zone is handled by more than just, or used by more than just people within 300 feet of the school zone. Um, that notification should have been sent out to every parent of every student that goes to that school zone. And I know that it's not required, but these are the things that we're looking at is that it seems like this developer is doing the bare minimum to try and get this through and get it passed and get going on it, not looking at the whole picture. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Tom Bradley. I'm Tom Bradley. I live at 1107 North Payne Street. And as I did last time, uh, I want to remind somebody about the driver who hit the track team that we now had a third death from that accident in war. Um, so our track team that also runs along the sidewalks, which lays the track, so people were on the sidewalk. But I was 
doing some calculating ago, he said that this is a 27 acre easement lot that's going to have a 4.7 to 4.9 houses per acre. Where's the roads? How, many, how much acreage is lost due to roads and in the, in the acreage? I presume that nobody has actually figured that out and said, hey, we're actually losing three or four acres to roads, so therefore we're putting more houses per acre than what is actually allowed. And the safety of our kids is the utmost because our neighborhoods, like my street, has no sidewalk. Ladies walking, babies in carriages, kids walking to school up and down Linda and Payne, and some on Skyline and Sunrise don't have very limited sidewalks. We have none on Linda, Linda and Payne at all. But there's only one on Sunrise, there's only one on Skyline. And so that's very limited. So that's a safety risk also for this increased traffic. Thank you. Does anyone else want to speak on this item? Yes, ma'am. <coughs> is there anybody else signed up? There is nobody else signed up. That's why. Yes. So if you can give your name and address again, I'd appreciate it. Kathy Houston, 1107 North Skyline. I appreciate you letting me speak because some things have come up as I've been listening. Um, I've lived in this neighborhood, northeast part of town, for 40 years at three different locations. And I think that gives a lot of people who have lived in this neighborhood for a very long time. Uh, but these three different locations have given me a unique perspective, I think, too. Um, one thing, the access management that they talked about is the reason that they didn't look at other streets, smaller streets into the neighborhood. I can tell you the five, uh, I listened to last the last meeting pretty carefully, uh, the re replays of it, and the places that they listed that they put their counters for the traffic are places that even, even though I live on Skyline now, I tend to avoid those intersections. And when I lived on Sunnybrook for 11 years, I lived uh, there from 1983 to 1994, and I've lived on Skyline from 1994 to the present. Um, and before that, we lived on North Perkins Road from 1980 to 83 in a little apartment, one of those huge apartment complexes. And, um, you know, I practically always avoid these big intersections, getting to work. I used to, to cut through uh, from North Perkins Road. I taught in Yale, in Yale High School. And I would go through on Redbud, and then hit Manning, and then go out on McElroy, and then turn up Stoller. None of these intersections would have caught me. And I still tend to take those kinds of streets through our neighborhood to get in and out. And none of these counters can catch me. <laughs> I mean, I'm not trying to not be caught by it. Oh, well, obviously. But, you know. It's just, I don't, I don't trust the traffic study. That's all I'm saying. I think there's a lot more traffic coming in from all over town from these other avenues that, that weren't, uh, weren't taken into account. Um, the other thing is this, us talking to city staff. I thought that during Aspen Heights, it was plenty. Uh, I mean, we've been here for other, other issues, and uh, this particular uh, problem with traffic is pretty well known to the city, I would think, but maybe we need to do a better job of communicating that again. Um, and what also bothers me is the idea that it is the responsibility of the school to fix this so that the developer can develop this in the way that would be most cost effective to uh, the, the people involved to build these homes. If they can't be built safely, then I think this is just not, and, and he can't build them cost effectively in this location, then this is not the right location if, it, if we can't put, street, uh, put streets through as has, has been suggested to Jardim. So I thank you for your time. Thank you. Anybody else would like to speak on this item? Yes, sir. I'm Lawrence Roy, 
1819 Lyndon. I signed up on the roster and I hope I didn't sign the volunteer to work for the city council. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I just want to congratulate and compliment whatever presentations has been made on this issue tonight. I think that we have some people that have done an outstanding job for the city to research this. And I hope that the commission requires that developers do some of this detailed research. And that's why I want to compliment those people. I don't want to repeat it. I just want to say something uh, about some of the issues. Another thing I want to say is that knowing these problems, and I've been here for every meeting, I'm a senior citizen of probably of our area, and I've seen that area grow. And when they put school in, I kind of wondered, I said, well, that's a good location because it's in the open area and they can expand and they can control the type of traffic and building additions to the area, which will not cost taxpayers to fix the problem after somebody just does the research and you cause big problems. So I'm going to end with that except to say this, any development in this area has almost got to have an access to Georgia. I've lived there long enough to where they told us on one occasion that they were going to pull a Georgia all the way up through where I asked where we live. It hasn't happened and it may happen later on. But it's going to cost more money to do all this. And here we are considering a problem that's already, I mean, an addition that's already a problem. So whatever is approved needs to have some kind of entry or exit to Jardo in this area next to our schools and the neighborhood that has already been developed. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate the opportunity to endorse what has been said before. Thank you. Anybody else that'd like to speak? In the third row back there. Uh, my name is Mary McFarland, and I live at 1917 North Scotland. That is the next to the last house on Skyline. So you can see I'm right in the trenches when they do the queue. I make it a habit I never leave my house between 3 and 4.30 in the afternoon, simply because I cannot get out uh, most of the time. And I do not want to meet a bus coming down between Skyline, between cars parked on each side of the street. So I'm going to beat a dead horse because Everybody's done a wonderful job of presenting and their, their plans. I want to say thank you to everybody who's participated in a wonderful democratic example of our how we work. But um, something that has not been mentioned and maybe hasn't isn't even a concern, but I personally would be concerned to move into this new neighborhood if I had to have emergency vehicles come down into that area, if I have a heart attack or a home invasion or a choking child, I don't particularly want my emergency vehicles taking the scenic route, which is all you're going to have if you don't have access to that arterial road in Jardo, because you, you just cannot get an emergency vehicle down in there quickly enough in most cases. And um, it's been more than once that I've seen a police car from flying down Skyline and almost missed that turn on the crater. Ambulances too. So even though it's not one that most people, that most of the time they'll come down, there is a, that aspect of somebody needs to study what it would take to get emergency vehicles down into that neighborhood and out again. And again, uh, the uh, 
the queue time for the schools, 15 or 20 minutes, yeah, that's probably from when they get on the school property to when they pick up the child and leave school property. That doesn't take into consideration that the hour, hour and a half that parents are sitting there on both sides of the street and there's barely one lane to go down through there. Like I say, from 3 to 4.30, it's almost impossible for any traffic to go down through there past the junior high. And that's not even counting the kids that are going every which way and playing in the park and doing whatever they, they're doing. So I really would encourage the developer to look really hard at putting that access to Jardo in because I personally would love to see a new neighborhood down in there. And thank you for your time. <coughs> Yes, ma'am. Sorry. I know it's, we're all getting wiggly, and I promise it'll be very short. Uh, two things. I'm Valerie Kisling, 1903 North Skyline, just a couple houses down from her. I do not begrudge the developer making money on this neighborhood. This is how they make their living, build these things. I would just ask that they. This is a community, and they put a little more of the human feeling into it more than how much money they can make out of it. And also, I think the uh, density laws, they have followed the letter of the law, but I don't think that was the intent of the law. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Stephanie Bundy, 901 East Dell Avenue. Um, I'm right at the corner of Dell and Benjamin. Um, so just want to give my personal testimony. Um, three years ago, I got married and moved in with my husband, uh, Ted Bundy. Uh, Ted Bundy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't remember now. Um, Ken Bundy. Um, just as an FYI, um, I'm questioning that choice of moving in with him now uh, simply because of the uh, major traffic that we constantly endure on Dell slash Benjamin. Um, so much so that my neighbor, as his solution to the problem, uh, was to just gun it in reverse, they'll have to stop. Um, I don't want to live in Mad Max um, beyond Thunderdome or anything like that. I chose to live here because I thought that it was peaceful and I'm living in a time now where I actually have to change uh, the time that I teach uh, in order to work around the schedule of the massive traffic on our street. So um, please uh, help us with that because um, I want to teach morning classes again. That would be really nice. So, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to speak? Are follow-ups allowed? I'll be brief, 90 seconds. Uh, That's okay. <laughs> I'm yes. All right. Behind you. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Jose Gutierrez. I'm uh, living 1501 East Mellon Drive. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the city of Stillwater and the city council for a great job on the environment in Stillwater. Now we I think you know, everyone take pride on the environment. <clears throat> uh, one thing, uh, I don't know if we have been in consideration, all those houses are going to take a lot of grass, trees out of the environment. And something that we uh, need to look at, how, how, many, how many trees per, per acre are the, the, the um, developer is planning on, on planting? Per uh, the removal of all the stuff that they removed. Um, kind of, uh, I haven't heard anybody say that anything about the environment yet. So maybe uh, we need to look closer into the things happening around us and, and consider that. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Anybody else would like to speak? I am the person. Can you answer that question about the? The, as I understand, our requirements are there are no tree plantings for a residential area. And the developer 
when they develop the property, they take whatever trees they want to out of the property, and they do not have to plant trees back. That's according to our code, and we can do, in terms of this commission, cannot do anything about that stuff. So to clarify, landscaping requirements do not exist for single-family residential structures in the, under the development code. We have a person that spoke before that wants to speak again. Lady. Is there a lady behind that? Oh! I would like to make one comment. Why don't you come up to the microphone for your name and address and... Okay, I want to make one comment. I moved into this neighborhood 15, 19, 20 years ago. I am not going to be there was a requirement in Stillwater, every building, every house had to have one tree. There was no building anything without one tree. And that should be the way it's done today. Yeah. Thank you for your comment. Are there any objections to him coming up again and speaking? <laughs> it's just to reiterate things that have already been said. Yes, sir. Come on over here. I'll try to make it quick. My name is Aaron Underwood. I live at 1920 North Grandview Street. When I heard very briefly that there was a development, I thought, wow, that's good that we're getting our sidewalks done and we're widening our streets. But I couldn't believe that we're building new houses when we've got kind of our own problems still to deal with. So. I just think that it's important that we think about maybe developing and finishing what we started here around the school and around the areas before we really move into building more stuff because we're just going to have more problems that we haven't fixed before. Anybody that's ever walked with uh, a stroller on Grandview Street knows that you have to walk in the street uh, because the driveways are bumpy and it's just not working, the sidewalks don't work. Um, and so we're just going to have more problems. So that's that's my my bit on the Grandview side of things. You still want to speak again? I'll be brief. And without objection, you can speak for maximum nine seconds. All right. Thank you. I uh, just a couple things in our meeting with uh, city staff. Uh, those of us from the neighborhood, it was implied that we were speaking on emotion, not fact. And I hope we've demonstrated tonight that our concerns are rooted in fact. Yes, we're emotional because we live here, but we have facts and evidence to support what we're saying. I also understand that the developer uh, has sunk a lot of money into this, and I don't wish him to lose any money, but I, would, I hope that the decision that's made tonight is not based on whatever money that the developer has spent so far, but based on what's right for the neighborhood. And I, I want to reiterate that Grandview will not solve anything long run. It will really move the problem sideways in the long run. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have another person that, did you raise your hand? Yes. Okay, come on up. <laughs> I'm Steve Franklin, 1424, North Skyline. Um, the truth is, is the majority of the neighborhood is here because we already have a congestion issue. And to add more to that would actually just probably break camel and so it just I think the majority of people are here is because of that and so I just wanted to reiterate that to you. Thank you for your comment. Anybody else? Seeing no one I'll close the public hearing before Mr. Ghost goes up and I'll have to say what he wants to I have a question for the staff and or legal. Can we legally require the developer to have a connection to Jardo, realizing that they have provided two or more connections? The short answer is no, you cannot. Um, if you were to approve with the condition that they have the access to Jardo, you would need to give them an opportunity to negotiate that and then a caveat for how to proceed forward if they cannot get that access. If I may? Yes, you may. 
So if the board decides to um, conditionally approve the plat, reasons must be given, and those reasons must refer specifically to parts of the comprehensive plan or city regulations in which the plot does not conform to. So I'll give my particular case in terms of if I want the developer to eliminate the connection at Moore Avenue, so they still have two connections and it's contingent on the Grandview connection, then am I understanding that's in compliance with the city codes and regulations and master plan. And therefore, legally, I cannot require a connection to Jardo. Is that a correct statement? I think I'm the one you're saying, as long as there are the two um, access points, then, and they are in compliance with the comprehensive plan and city regulations, then no, you cannot have an additional requirement of Jardo. Payne Street, there's been discussions about Sunrise Avenue that only be 20 foot wide. It is a city street on city right away that the city rebuilt the street 20 foot wide. Can we require the developer to widen that street since it's on city right away and the city built the street? You can make the request as a condition in, in terms of, and we had this discussion with, for example, with Silverton about trying to ask them to widen. The developer had discussions with city staff, city engineering was not willing in that case to cost share on paying. The developer later came back as a gesture of goodwill and offered to improve that to city, widen it to city standards as a conciliatory measure for trying to help deal with potential traffic issues. If you remember, there was primarily one access in and a secondary emergency access. In this case, you have two, three proposed access points within code. So you can make the request. It would be something that as a condition we would have to work through. I would also add that if you provide conditional <coughs> approval, the, the process going forward would be they would submit revised plan, uh, revised plan to the city, we would review it, and then it would come back to you for approval. The revised preliminary plan? The revised preliminary plan would come back to you for approval before any final plan would be submitted. And that is per code. I concur with that. Does anyone on the commission want to ask the staff or legal any questions at this time? <coughs> if we do that, if you do, if you did something like that, there's 60 days that if that it's automatic, if it gets certain, has a certain amount of time. Does this conditional aspect does that? Include? Does that increase the timing on that? Right, that just the 60 day rule would not apply if you approve the plat conditionally. Mr. Gold, do you want to say anything at this particular time? And while you're coming up and thinking of what you might want to say, yes. you may have caught one item that I brought up that I want to see if you're objecting to, and that is, I'd like to eliminate the connection to Moore Avenue. I believe that's right in the middle of the highest area of the school. It leaves you with two other access, which one of them goes to the Grandview connection. I've Do you have I've talked to our client, and they have no objection to taking more out. Um, we've talked to Esther about it as well, as far as how would that impact access to the site, and she doesn't feel there'd be a negative aspect to that. So our client is okay with removing more and making it a pedestrian access. Um, I just, I got, I got a question for legal on the, the balance of the conditional approval. Does it come back to here? Because what I heard on the previous preliminary plat had conditions that that's not 
coming back that as long as those conditions are met, that the improvement plans and final plat can proceed. And um, the ordinance provides that conditionally approved plats um, shall be required to be submitted back to okay. the um, planning commission for their review before the final can be um, approved. So, Mr. Gold, I'll give my non-legal opinion, and then the attorney can tell me whether I'm doing the process correctly. So, if we go forward with this and we eliminate the connection to more, that would be a condition that you'd have to redo the plumber plat and bring it back here. But I was talking about earlier the grand few connection and putting on notice. So you see in the public meeting that it'll be finished before the final plat. If it's finished before the final plat, then I'll remember that and vote for the final plat. If it's if it is not done before the final plat, I'm not making a condition. But I'm telling you right now, I would not vote for the final plat unless that was finished. And I guess point of clarification on that, this is going to be platted in two phases. Phase one will be half of it, phase two will be half of it. I'd like to make that contention upon approval of the second final plat, which is when the traffic is at 130 lots, not 65. So the 65 lot goes up to Brook Avenue, so you would build Brook Avenue. Well, now, South. and if we take more out, we would build the West Road up to Crayler as part of Phase One, so that the access at Crayler, the access at Payne, would be constructed as part of Phase One. So when you say half, which half is it? The south half? or the north half, or the east half, or the west half? The south half is phase one. And in this case, block two, uh, we'll just do blocks. Block one, block two, block four, five, and block three, lots one through 10. There's a, there's a phase line on that. And, and that, to me, is the southern half. Right. To have your second connection, you just be on the road up there to Kyle. And then to Crayler. So, Crayler. so, yeah, block six, seven, eight, and the north half of block three would be phase two. And before you do the final plot for phase two, then you have a brand new connection. I, I suspect it'll be done sooner. I'm just. Oh, I don't like that word sooner. <laughs> Are you expect to be done earlier? It, earlier. Oklahoma yes. State does not like that word from down south. So, so it's earlier. Earlier. Okay. I fully understand that. Do you wish to say anything else to this commission this time? I think the rest of the items that came up during the public hearing, um, we've addressed some of those previously. Um, as far as staging for the schools, this neighborhood's going to provide an additional parking lot for the schools during pickup. So hopefully that would alleviate some of the concerns. A, a road to Jardot would provide another pass through to the junior high, which could create some, some safety issues within the neighborhood. Uh, level of C service is not the worst service. Level of service F is. Um, in traffic studies, and we can bring Esther back up if there's some more questions about the traffic study. Um, it's like your grade, A, B, C, A, B, C, D, and F. Right, right. Um, the, the density, that came up again. There's six acres in roads, two acres in detention ponds. Those acreages were considered in the gross density. Gross density, total area, total number of lots. So that's what I got. Any questions? Seeing no questions from the commission, the staff come up and give their alternatives. So, based on everything said, the staff has the following findings. One, the preliminary plan as proposed currently meets all the zoning and subdivision requirements for the zoning district. It has two acts. That meets all the requirements. That meets, Go ahead. that meets the RSS zoning requirements. 
terms of density, layout, etc. It meets the subdivision requirements for at least two access points because it's over 30 lots. The comprehensive plan recommends low density residential. There's residential and ag in this area right now as far as existing land use. As I just said, the proposed density is in line with the RS zoning district. In spite of the issues brought to the table, and staff is happy to hear them, um, we feel that it is in conformance with the comprehensive plan with regard to the land, future land use element. Because as state as one person already stated, low density residential covers up to 21 units an acre. With that said, in terms of alternatives, one, you can accept the findings as presented and recommend approval or approve as presented. You can find the request is not appropriate and recommend denial. You can provide and you can accept the findings with conditions and give conditional approval with the stipulations noted on the record knowing that that conditional approval means it would come back to you for review again. If you feel additional items are needed for discussion or information, you can table the item to a certain date later. Any questions staff can answer? Sunrise Avenue. In accordance with the major street and highway plan, that's a collector street? It is classified as a collector, yes, both in the transportation plan and the comprehensive plan. What is the <coughs> section for Collector Street? It is wider than 20 feet 1 inch by far. Somewhere in the neighborhood, 36 inches, 36 feet. Is there a there? As far as street width, yes. And for the record, the collector is designed to handle bring traffic from multiple local streets together to funnel that to a larger arterial street. Other questions staff can answer. Any other questions for the staff, legal or anybody else? Did he just state that Sunrise is construed to be a collector? Sunrise, in terms of our major street and highway plan, right. In the future, should be a collector street. Behind collector street, it's only 20 foot wide. It should be somewhere in the future, if the city ever gets money, widened to 36 foot wide. So, as the chair mentioned earlier, when it was rebuilt, it was rebuilt to that 20 feet one inch width for multiple reasons at the time. As the community grows, that street width should change to that 36 feet in order to accommodate additional traffic. And Jardot, hopefully, will be enlarged to a four or five lane street someday in the future as development occurs in this area. Yes. When? We have no idea. Those, those would be issues that with additional input from residents as well as the community as a whole, the city could have better guidance on with regard to the comp plan, transportation element, and the CIP. Any other questions of the staff or legal? Commission discussion? Two things I wanted to bring up. I mean, one, certainly we all know that the city of Stillwater has many areas where our roads are adequate uh, to the development of non. We have sewer with water pressure issues. These have all come before us over time. And certainly we, we know that and that that's going on. But we also know that none of those things are going to happen if we don't have people here in Stillwater. We're not going to fix any of those problems. So we're sort of caught in this uh, quandary between the two. So that's just, I just, well, I know we certainly know that there are places we've 
talked about this on a number of things just in the last few months. Uh, the second thing, there was a comment that said that infill development must be compatible with the existing area. I think we, in the last, just in the last few months, have had some situations where we made decisions about infill that doesn't necessarily fit with the existing area for many reasons and many types of things. And I think that while we certainly want to be uh, cognizant of the existing areas, we, we also have to make the decision the best we can for the city and for the citizens thereof. So I think in, in that regard, you know, we have attention here. Clearly in the local, this local area, they are affected and affected mentally by it. I, mean, I don't think any of us can deny that. So we have to make a decision from my perspective what's best for the city and the growth, future growth of the city going forward. And so while I'm, I'm I understand their concerns. I also feel like development in this part of Stillwater is important and has been an important part of the growth of Stillwater. And I can't fix all the problems that have gone on there, but what I do know is we get people doing things in there, and we might do something about it. The other commissioner wants to say anything at this particular time. Well, I have an issue with that traffic study, which I think is fundamentally flawed. Uh, I still don't understand why the count isn't done on the interior streets, which is where the true impact is going to be felt. So I, I, I can't describe a lot of validity to that traffic study. Um, I can understand the argument that we need development, we do. Uh, Stillwater needs housing. Uh, I just still have a, a lot of difficulty uh, saying that development or growth uh, should take total precedence over established neighborhoods. There should be balance there. I would like to see in development where, almost like a doctor, do no harm. And I'm, a, I'm concerned that in this instance, there will be. Uh, I just think there's a real concern with uh, emergency vehicle access into this area with the school, the junior high, and the elementary, and adding 132 uh, lots without a ERIS out to Jardo. I think that's a major safety issue. Um, I just, and the discussion uh, related to the school district will need to figure out how to accommodate this additional traffic. Uh, again, there's a, this is another thing I have an issue with. Uh, so, and, and there's a comment made, yes, uh, we have, the, the body has approved uh, infill development that was not necessarily compatible with the existing built environment. Well, I disagree with that. Uh, so, uh, kind of veering off on tangents, but I think the essence is this traffic issue, the street infrastructure issue is a major issue and I cannot support this development unless there is a more reasonable resolution to this traffic and the street issue. Uh, I would like to see the developer and the uh, neighborhood city uh, come up with a, a reasonable compromise to address this. I just don't think that the neighborhood should have to bear the brunt of this, the negative impact of this development. Any other comment at this particular time? I'll, I'll make a few statements here. Statement number one is this development 
is in accordance and density with our codes and regulations. And even though some of the surrounding area has less of a density, I believe in a city that this is an appropriate development in this particular area, and I have no problem with the density. I'd love to have a connection with Jardo. I talked to Monty Carnes about this, and he's concerned if they have a connection with Jardo that this will be a cut through area for the school situation and a future safety concern on Jardo 10, 15 years from now when there's future development. What I'm hearing from legal and the staff is because they have two other or three other connections, and I'd like to eliminate the connection to Warren to make it pedestrian only, so there's two connections that we're not in good legal standing to have a connection with Georgia. With the connection on through Grandview. I believe that this development is acceptable and I would vote for this development as long as that connection with Grandview is made before phase two is built. Anybody else would like to say anything? Do I hear a motion? Why don't you speak in the microphone? Because this public meeting, so yeah, I'm sorry. Time. No, I was saying if you were just you had brought up the fact that you were fine A with the closing of more and B that the second that, that Grandview was open before the completion of phase two. Before the start of the phase two. Before the start <coughs> of phase two. Yes. And then I would make the motion to accept the findings and approve the promotion plan as presented with the, those two recommendations or those two uh, conditions thereof. If I may. Um I think initial plat is motion and second and pass. Uh, reasons must be provided for the conditions and they have to be re referred specifically to the comp plan or to the regulations as to why the plat does not conform. I want to eliminate more avenue because it leaves two connections and I believe that it is in the middle of a highly congested in the morning area of the school district and the developer agrees to that reduction in connection and make it residential only. Do you need any more reasons than that? Thank you. Is there anybody that's going to second that? Not hearing a second. And Robert's rule, the chairman can now second that motion. Is that correct? I will second the motion. Call for the vote. does not pass. There are two yes and two no's. Do we have more discussion or does someone want to make another motion?
two commissioners that voted no would you vote for a motion that requires a connection to Jardo and then legal works through that issue I would be totally supporting that supportive of that. So if you want to make a motion to that effect, I would still like to include eliminating the more connection, it's only pedestrian only, and having the brand view done completed before phase two starts. like to make the motion, but I want to have it phrased correctly, so. Have as much time as you desire, or if you want to talk to legal, you can talk to legal in the microphone so everybody can hear you. So how would such a motion be structured? You can approve the plat conditionally upon an access on Jardot, make m more uh, pedestrian only access. What's it, Grandview? What's that right in? Grandview. Grandview. And also for Grandview to be completed prior to phase two. Start. Starting. And reasons will need to be provided for all those conditions that relate to the comp plan and city regulations. And I've already provided reasons for more in the Grandview connection. So the question is, what is the rationale to require the developer to connect to Jardo that is in accordance with the comp plan? There was phrasing in part of the discussion earlier regarding the integrity of the neighborhood. And I think that would be adequate justification governed by the comp plan. Thank you. She's ruling that you have justification. Whether it's legally justified or not, she's not ruling on that effect. So, so that'll be in her minutes, and that'll be our justification. Okay. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Any discussion before we vote? Let's vote. The motion passes. Four to zero. Three A, regular meeting summary of February fourth, twenty twenty. It's the next agenda item. Let me profile my agenda. Any discussion on that item? Do I hear a motion? Motion to approve. Second. <laughs> item 4A, next planning commission meeting is March 3rd, 2020. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Stand adjourned, thank you.